Hi everybody, welcome back to another episode of Talking Cardboard. My name is Corey, and first and foremost, I just wanted to send out an apology saying it has been a couple weeks since the last video here on my top 50 favorite board games of all time list because we hosted our own room at Con of the North here in Minneapolis, Minnesota. We hosted our own room again this year in 2024. We did it last year as well, had a lot of fun, but that took a lot of effort on the planning side of things and also running our room during the convention. So that took up a lot of work. So just wanted to send a quick apology for that, that there was a little bit of a break in the action for the list here, but I am back at it now with my top 20 favorite board games of all time. Today's list are going through games 20 up to number 11. Let's get started. All right, to number 20 on my list was number 22 last year. It is a game by Awakened Realms that just has a fantastic production value, production quality to this game. The components, everything to do with it is just amazing aesthetically. And this game is The Great Wall. The Great Wall, I've only gotten it played a few times, but the few times I've played it, is just, it really solidifies its standing here in the, around the top 20 part of my favorite games of all time each and every year. Like I said, last year it was number 22, this year it's number 20, so it's staying steady, staying pretty strong right in the same spot, but for good reason. Not only is the production quality just fantastic, I have the miniatures version of the game, the miniatures are beautiful, the board art is incredibly beautiful, everything to do with it is just aesthetically pleasing, but also the gameplay itself is really fun as well. In the Great Wall, it has a feeling of cooperation, but it's not a fully cooperative game. There is a fully cooperative game mode to this game, but the competitive mode, the standard mode, is you are competing against you and your opponents, but you're doing so in almost kind of a partial competitive environment where you've got these hordes of the Mongols attacking you and you have to fend them off. And the better you can fend off the invading hordes, the more points you get, the, mo the player with the most points at the end of the game wins. And the way you're doing that is with simple work worker placement, you're trying to bolster more troops and get different units, send them to the Great Wall to defend it as hordes of units are coming in and trying to crash through. But the, the, the way you're doing that on the worker placement spots on the board is really cool and really unique. The unique worker placement mechanism in this game has to do with a worker placement spot does not activate until all the spaces on that spot have been filled up. So you can put a couple of your workers out on a location to try to get a particular troop or to build a certain section of the wall or whatever else you're trying to do, but you won't actually get to take and follow through with that action until all the places on that spot have filled up, either by you or your opponent's workers. Really cool the way that works. Also, there's some asymmetric player powers in this game and everything about this game feels very asymmetric for such a, a simple worker placement game at heart. So that is my number 20, The Great Wall. My number 19 game this year was number 13 last year, so just falling a little bit, but it is another worker placement style game, and this game is Dwellings of Eldervale. Dwellings of Eldervale is a ton of fun. It's, it's a very kind of dry Euro, dry worker placement Euro game at heart, but the theme behind it is really cool. You've got dragons and you've got you know wizards and you've got all these different powers going on and you're sending these workers out to different locations to do that. It's got some light combat in the game as well. You can attack opponents to try to fend them off the region for kind of an area control on different zones on the board. And the different zones, like I said, are worker placement. So they're giving you actions by going there, but you're also trying to kind of defend them and area control them as well because in Dwellings of Eldervale you get a lot of points by turning your meeples into dwellings or putting like a rooftop on top of their head and then they are a dwelling for the rest of the game and dwellings score you a lot of points. It's really cool in this game too kind of like in the Great Wall where some of the units or your, or your player powers are very asymmetric well also in Dwellings of Eldervale your characters or the, the faction you choose is asymmetric and is unique, but also the different meeples that you're sending to the board, the different uh, you know workers that you're sending to the board also have asymmetric powers as well. So that is my number 19, Dwellings of Eldervale. 
All right, and my number 18 game of all time was number 30 last year. So this game is really climbing. It is another Euro game, but another game with a beautiful production behind it. It looks completely gorgeous, uh, really nice artwork, really nice components, really nice graphic design. Everything to do with this version of this game is really, really pretty. And this is Kanban EV. I did have Kanban Driver's Edition back in the day, and the aesthetic of that game wasn't nearly the aesthetic of what Kanban EV is now that it's kind of got the more deluxified big box version of it. It is a Vito Lacerda game, which Vito Lacerda, the designer, he is known for very, very heavy designs, but you know, simple mechanisms at heart, but the strategy behind it and the decision making behind it is very, very complex. And Kanban EV, I would say, is one of his more simpler designs when it comes to the strategic options and kind of grasping what you can and can't do on your turn compared to his other games, but it still is definitely a brain burner at that. In Kanban EV, you are simply in a automotive factory uh, building cars and adding parts onto the cars and getting designs for new vehicles and uh, applying those designs to building the new vehicles, sending, sending the vehicles off the production line. And all in the while, you've got a, your boss, Sandra, walking around the warehouse, making sure you're doing what you're doing and getting the proper training sessions that you need to do. And really, it sounds like a job simulation type of game. And I guess thematically it is, but it plays out very fun. It plays, it plays like a game, not just a job simulation. So, but I really like that Sandra, the, the basic version of Sandra in this game is the mean version of Sandra from a, the previous edition, where you get negative victory points if you are not doing too well in certain departments. So it really makes you worry about what you're doing in particular departments and not just allowing the other players to kind of pull their weight in those departments and you just kind of cherry pick from them as they're doing the work in those departments. You really have to diversify and do a lot of the work yourself, which is really fun. But like I said, the theme is just fantastic as well. Yeah, that's my number 18, Kanban EV. All right, and my number 17 favorite game of all time was number 17 last year and is one of my all-time favorite Stefan Feld games ever. And this, this game, I believe, has been on my list ever since I started doing this list like five, six years ago. And I don't think it'll leave the top 50 games of all time anytime soon. Like I said, it's staying strong at number 17. I really, really like it and is one of my favorite Stefan Felds, not my favorite, spoilers, but it is one of my favorite Stefan Feld games, and this game is Bruges. I also play Bruges most often with its expansion, The City on the Zwin, which adds some cool things as well, but base game Bruges is just fine also. It's just a fantastic game. I love games that have multi-use cards, and Bruges does it so well. You have a hand of cards, you're using those cards to trigger these different actions on your turn, and like I said, they're multi-use. So every card has five or six different uh, options or five or six different actions you can do with that card, and I love just kind of thinking about what card I should use when for what ability that would get me the most benefit, and it's really, really cool. The multi-use cards just really open up that uh, design space and that decision space to really kind of get creative with your turns and get victory points in creative ways. So you are also trying to build houses and put uh, people in those houses because the, once they're in a house, they give you special actions that you can do with those cards also. You are building out a river, you're trying to avoid these threats and hazards that are coming your way so you don't get negative victory points from those. And I just love um, everything to do with this game and the puzzle behind it and those multi-use cards. So that is my number 17, Bruges. All right, and my number 16 favorite game of all time was number six last year. So it is falling out of my top 10 favorite games of all time now, and that's just because it's hard to get this game to the table. The game, this game lasts anywhere from three to three and a half hours every time we play it. It's a very lengthy game. I'm really hoping and praying for an expansion that comes out sometime in the near future. Hopefully that shortens the game length or kind of speeds it up. This game is compared to Terraforming Mars a lot. And I know Terraforming Mars got an expansion called Prelude, which really sped the game up by a good half an hour, 45 minutes for drafting and um, starting with starting resources at the beginning of the game to really kind of speed that along. And unfortunately for this game, the first expansion just kind of added more content and didn't really speed up the gameplay at all. Because 
I mean, if this if this game, for example, played in like the around the two hour time mark, this would definitely be in my top 10 favorite games probably forever because it's just that great of a game. But like I said, the game length is hurting it a little bit for how long it plays. This game is Ark Nova. Ark Nova, if you're watching the channel, you probably already know about it because everybody on the planet has been talking about it and how great it is, but it is really a great game. Ark Nova, you are building out your own zoo of particular animals. You're building out enclosures on your player board, these different polyomino shapes that you're fitting on your player board. The different animal cards that you play have different tags and different requirements and symbols on it that you need to have before you're allowed to play them in your zoo. But uh, it's, it's really cool the way this game works. You're getting sponsors by these other zoos, you're trying to have partner zoos in other countries as well to try to give you some discounts on some of the animals that you're getting. And you're really just trying to build out the best zoo you can possible uh, for, for victory points. This game has a really unique scoring mechanism that is also present in the game Rajas of the Ganges, but Ark Nova does it as well, and I really, really enjoy it. And that's where you are getting these appeal points or like tickets for your zoo on one track that goes around the board. And then you have another player piece for points on the other side of the board that is heading in the opposite direction. And as soon as those two tracks meet and cross over one another, that triggers the last round of the game. And and whoever can get their pieces to cross the furthest wins the game. And like I said, one side of the track is like the tickets or the appeal for your zoo, trying to get more people to come to, come to your zoo to look at your animals. And the other side are the conservation points, which you're trying to make these conservation efforts. You're trying to house animals and send them back off to the wild when they get healthy enough. That'll give you conservation points. And as soon as those tickets and conservation points cross over, that is essentially the goal of the game. But a very heavy, very thinky game. Also, the main mechanism in this game that I really like is kind of like a conveyor belt of cards, like these action cards. Everybody starts off the game with the same five action cards that are in slots one through five on your player board. And when you play an action, the power of that action card is whatever slot it is in. So if it's in slot five, it's the most powerful it can be. If it's in slot one or two, it's not quite as powerful. But as soon as you play an action from a slot, you actually then put it down to slot number one and all the other action cards slide up and get more powerful. Like I said, if there's an expansion that kind of shortens that game length, I would really love it and it I could see it rising back up to the top of my list here again. But for now, it is number 16 and that is Ark Nova. All right, to my number 15 favorite game of all time is brand new to the list. It is one of the first brand new games to the list, I th think here, if not the very first one. Yeah, there was a couple others that actually jumped back onto the list that were on previous years, but this is my first brand new to the list game. And uh, at number 15, this game is Revive. Revive came out last year or a couple years ago now, about a year and a half ago. Uh, and it just came out with a splash. It's a lot of fun. It's another game that has multi-use cards or multi-actions on a card that I really, really like. But this game does it in a way where it's more medium weight. It's not like a heavy, heavy game. It's just done with simple symbols. And the symbols, the different symbols will give you these different actions or resources depending on where you play the card. And what I mean by that, everybody has a player board that has these unique technology tracks on it that you can that you can get technologies with throughout the game. But what's unique about the card play is that you have these different slots on your player board. You have slots or two slots at the top of your board, two slots at the bottom. And depending on where you slot your card, whatever symbols are left showing on the card after sliding it underneath your player board are the symbols you get to do for your actions. It really feels like you're going out and exploring this post-apocalyptic world where it essentially has frozen over because of like an ice age or something. And now that the snow and the ice have been thawing out, you've been surviving underground for thousands of years. You guys are now coming out of the ground and trying to discover these different locations and try to you know, make do with what you have on the surface world now after living beneath it for so long. So it's really cool, the theme behind it, but yeah, the, the card play, the multi-use cards again, really does it well for me. You have different asymmetric factions that have these different goals and different things you're doing with your personal player board as well. And these technology tracks that are on your main player board are a lot of fun too, because you're unlocking these different uh, tech tiles that give you different actions and different powers as well. The way that really gels together, really gels together well and all within like a medium weight game. So like I said, not very heavy, very easy to teach to pretty much anyone and one that I keep coming back to over and over again. So that is my number 15, Revive.
All right, and my number 14 was number 11 on the list last year, and this game is Heaven and Ale. Heaven and Ale, I've talked about this game for many, many years now, and it was a game that I actually got for either my birthday or for Valentine's Day one year from my wife way back in the day, and when I got it and received it, I was like, ah, I just don't know if I'm really gonna like this game. I mean, the theme is just a bunch of monks that are brewing beer, and the better you can brew your beer, the more points you get at the end of the game, and it just didn't really seem like it was gonna be that much fun, but after playing it, I just fell in love with it, and it's been really high up on my list each and every year since then. So like I said, in Heaven and Ale, you are trying to gather uh, gather resources to brew your own beer, and you're doing that by basically collecting tiles and adding the tiles to your personal player board area. And you've got a sunny side to the board, you've got a shaded side to the board, and depending on what tile you draft, depending on where you place that tile, it'll get you various things. If you place the tile on the shaded side of your board, when you activate that tile in the future, it'll give you more money, more income to then spend on more tiles. But if you place that tile on the sunny side of the board and activate it in the future, you're not getting any money for that at all, but you're gathering that amount of resources for your beer. It's a very, very tight game uh, money-wise. Monetarily, it's a very tight game. Very Money is very hard to come by, but you're trying to balance you know, how many tiles are you gonna build to generate that income and generate that money coming in and balance it with how many tiles are you gonna actually place on the sunny side of the board to grow those hops and uh, barley and different resources you need for your beer. And yeah, it's really cool the way it's done too. It's very simple. It's a rondelle style game where everybody is on the same rondelle track and you can send your worker piece as far along the track as you want to, to then stop on a space to collect a tile. But as soon as you do that, you can't go back and collect any of the tiles that you had that you had passed up on. So you can go, like I said, as far as you want, collect the tile, but you can't go back. So that unique decision, uh, you know, decision space is really fun, but you can also take it slow and you know hop along and, and, and collect as many tiles as you, as you can afford along the way, but then you risk your opponent jumping way ahead and taking a tile that you may have really needed. So that is the really fun uh, brain burner part in this game. And like I said, wasn't expecting to like it, but if that sounds interesting to you, you know, not based on theme at all, but just based on mechanisms, I highly recommend it and highly recommend that you give Heaven and Ale a try. All right, and my number 13 was number 15 last year, so staying strong in the pretty much the same spot again. And this game is one that uh, Talking Cardboard as a channel got a lot of flack for back in the day because we actually rated the game so low when we first played it because of the high barrier to entry, the high learning curve, the uh, it's not very it's not a very easy game to teach, and all those elements played into us giving it a very low score back about four or five years ago when the channel first started, and we did get a lot of flack for it because yes, it really is a great game, but we just didn't really I don't want to say we didn't see it at the time, but those barriers to entry really lowered our score, maybe more than we should have. But now, you know, more as more seasoned gamers, you know, today in our career, we really, really love the heck out of Root. In this game, like I said, it's a bunch of asymmetric factions. Everybody plays completely differently. It's very difficult to teach because you have to teach each and every faction and what each faction is good at doing, what they're bad at doing, what they're trying to accomplish, what they can and can't do. And you're, you have to understand uh, each and every faction before you actually play the game, not just your own, in order to actually do well. So a lot of varied entry, it's very difficult to teach, and a lot of a lot of moving parts to this game, but once you get the hang of it and everybody at the table learns it, it is a lot of fun to play. You're basically trying to vie for control, area control in these different sections of the woods to get victory points, and the first player up to 30 victory points wins the game. And that's pretty much the whole goal of the game. That's one of the main ways to win is just get victory points and get up to 30 to win, but you're, like I said, you're doing that in various ways. And all of your opponents are doing their actions in completely different ways as well to try to stop you from doing what you need to do all in the while doing what they need to do with their faction to score points. So yes, a lot of fun, a game I would highly recommend trying and is really a modern day classic in my opinion. Uh, Root will never get old. You can, Like I said, the factions are so different that when you sit down at the table to try a faction that you haven't played in a while, it feels like a completely new experience each and every time. So that is one of the reasons I really Really like it but if that idea of area control and almost kind of like a war skirmish game mixed with completely asymmetric player powers on a player board 
or not even player powers, but completely different asymmetric mechanisms that you're doing with each faction. If that sounds interesting to you, definitely give Root a try because I think you will thoroughly enjoy it. So that's my number 13, Root. All right, to my number 12, favorite game of all time is another brand new game to the list. And this one is debuting very, very high. Like I said, debuting at number 12. I'm very, very surprised in this. I've only played the game a couple times and it could just be like, you know, it's so fresh and new and exciting to me that it has jumped up that high, but I really don't think this one is the case. I think this game is just such a brilliant design. It's just designed so, so brilliantly. It's so special that I think it really deserves the number 12 game of all time on my list. And this game is Guards of Atlantis 2. Guards of Atlantis 2 is like a Kickstarter or GameFound exclusive game. They're coming out with their second printing of it again this year. By the end of this year, I did back it this time, but it's just a ton of fun. It's supposed to be a mobile style game that is converted into a tabletop game. And mobile is the massive online battle arena style game where you've got you know heroes of different factions with different abilities and you've got these minions that are helping you out and uh, it's a team game. I really like this for the team aspect and it's one of the very few team games that are on my entire list. So I think that's another reason why it stands out quite a bit from all the other games on my list. But you and your team of players, uh, this game plays anywhere from like four to 10 players. So you can really play in large teams, which is a lot of fun, but you are playing actions with cards. Each card has an initiative value on the top of the card that'll tell you when you get to activate your power. And the power on the card is anywhere from like moving your minions or your hero around the board and then doing like a specific action depending on your uh, relationship to everything else that is surrounding you on the board at that time. So again, it's a very, very puzzly game and a lot of fun to try to crack that puzzle in your head as you play and trying to outguess your opponents while doing it. So Guards of Atlantis just does it so well. So, so well. It's very simple, but the way the cards read and the way the abilities on the cards play out is just very unique and strategic and does it in such such a simple way but the strategic depth is super heavy you're trying to push your opponents back to their base to try to have them retreat or try to deal damage to their main base enough to have the base fall and if you can do either of those two things either push your opponents all the way back to their base get them to retreat all the way or if you can damage their base enough to where it is has fallen and they they can't recover from it then you win the game and like i said you're just doing that with the simple play of a card you know, the card has, has a movement value and an attack value on it, but it also just has a unique action in the text of the card that plays out so cool. And each faction feels completely different from any other faction that your opponents or your teammates are playing with too. So it's, it's fun to kind of sit down and go, oh, okay, you're playing with that faction, I'm playing with them, you're playing with them, and we're all on the same team, and how are we gonna make our factions kinda gel together and work together so we're one cohesive unit, and you know, have, you know, know, greasing the gears enough to have us all work together, and then your opponents are kinda doing the same thing and talking to one another with that as well, and trying to best formulate a plan based on what factions they have, and just a ton of fun. A lot of fun, uh, can't recommend it enough. It's such a shame that it's only like a game found exclusive game and that it's not coming out to retail, or as far as I know, not coming out to retail because I think the world should experience this game. It's, it is that good of a game. So if that sounds interesting to you, seek it out, maybe look on game found for maybe a late pledge on that if you still can, but that is Guards of Atlantis 2. All right, and the last game on my list here for today is number 11. It was number seven last year, so just falling just outside my top 10 favorite games of all time. And it could be dethroned in the future based on a new version of the game that I just get, got back here recently on my shelf. But for now, it holds the spot in its own right. And this game is Terra Mystica. Terra Mystica, another, another heavy Euro game, but another game that I just fell in love with after the first or second time playing it. Another one with a lot of rules and a lot of little things you need to keep in mind. But once you understand it and understand what you're supposed to do, it's a lot of fun. And Terra Mystica, 
Again, it's asymmetric factions or asymmetric races that every player is playing with. It's a fully competitive game, but each race plays out completely different. They have a unique uh, special ability. Like I said here, I got the newer version on my shelf here behind me that's called Age of Innovation. And Age of Innovation actually adds even more uh, player, player variability, player power variability, and replayability to the game as well. So that changes it a little bit. You are trying to build out structures and buildings and strongholds and dwellings and different things on the map and attach them to one another. You know, keep them adjacent to one another to build out a, a town for victory points. And you're doing these other goals, these round goals for victory points, trying to do it the best you can. But another game where the economy of the game is extremely tight. The money is extremely tight. The workers are extremely tight. Everything is very tight that if you make one wrong move or one bad mistake, it really could hurt you for the rest of that round. So that is one of the things that could be kind of a turnoff for some people in this game, that it is such a tight game that you have to be careful uh, and really think about the move you're about to take because if you're just off by just a little bit, it might throw off your plans for the rest of the round without you even being aware that you did it to yourself. So you can only build your buildings on a piece of land that is native to your race. So for example, if you're playing a race that likes to build in the forest, you can only build on forest tiles. So you are physically taking workers and sh the shovel's action to physically terraform the land and create that space that your race can build into. So you're terraforming like the desert into a forest so you can place your house in your forest or the mountains into a forest or what, what have you. And you know every different race has a different piece of land or a different type of land that they like to build on. And also you have adjacency bonuses too that if you build adjacent to an opponent, you get some power from that and there's an actual power track on each player board that as your power moves around uh, in, the, in a circle, when you get it to the last space on that power board, you can then spend power to do more actions. So it's a very combo-y game too. You're trying to combo with everything you're doing and trying to plan ahead with everything you're doing uh, strategically to do the best you can with victory points. So if that sounds like a lot of fun to you, uh, definitely give it a shot. It's, it's one of my favorites, as you can tell here, just barely fell out of the top 10 games of all time at number 11 here, but one that I keep coming back to and one that I keep requesting to play uh, at multiple game sessions over the course of a year. So definitely give that a shot if that sounds interesting to you. That's Terra Mystica. All right, everybody, so that does it here for today's list. My game's number 20 up to number 11. I hope you all enjoyed. As always, leave comments below with some of your favorite games of all time. Definitely love to hear what you are all are playing and what you all are enjoying, so I can maybe give some of those games a shot myself if I haven't played some of those. So definitely like to hear about that and respond to all your comments below. Like and subscribe to the video if you have, uh, have a quick second to do that. We really appreciate it. It really goes a long way to help us out a lot. And stay tuned here in the near future for not only uh, you know my top 10, I'll join the rest of the Talking Cardboard crew and we'll do our top 10 favorite games of all time here together, all in one sitting. But also I know John from Talking Cardboard and maybe a couple of the other members of Talking Cardboard will definitely be coming out with their top 20 favorite games of all time. So stay tuned to the channel here soon for those lists as well where they go through their top 20 to 11. And then like I said, we'll all get together and sit around one table to discuss all of our top 10 favorite board games of all time coming here shortly in the next couple weeks. So until next time, you all have fun gaming and enjoy your day.